first, congratulations to Paul McGuire for his induction into the South Carolina Football Hall of Fame. Congratulations to Paul, his family, Beverly, his children, his grandchildren, all his friends around the world that know him in the best kind of way. I want to talk a little bit different about uh, Paul McGuire, the Paul McGuire that came from Youngstown, Ohio to the Citadel in 1956 to be a cadet and to play football. I'm not sure that he knew that he was going to be a cadet, to tell you the truth. I remember seeing him as he walked across the parade field when he first got here. Of course, freshmen were not allowed to walk across the parade field, but everybody was afraid to tell Paul that he couldn't walk across the parade field. So some years later, Paul and I were roommates. And as you can see from some of the things around here, Paul's had a very, very distinguished career, both in playing football in the professional ranks, certainly his time at the Citadel, and of course his broadcasting career and all the friends that he has in that particular venue. Paul was the kind of guy that you can depend upon as a friend. He was the person that you could feel that he was there for you at any time. He was a great, great person for the Citadel in its history because as he traveled around the world and as he done, did broadcasting in football and other venues, he was the kind of person who would talk about his time at the school. While he was here, I wouldn't say that he was the best cadet uh, I would say that as his roommate, I probably did more cleaning than he did. But if you take a quick look at this picture, you could see the kind of student that he was. He thought he was the regimental commander. Of course, he was not the regimental commander. He was probably a senior private. And these were the members of the T Company where he was uh, assigned when he first came to the Citadel and he spent his next four years. Why did he get T Company? We, at that particular time, we were all arranged by height. And most of the football players and basketball players were put in T company or in A company. So we all were about the same height. Paul probably didn't reach that particular height that he was supposed to, but anyway, he got into T company where people thought he'd be protected. I want to tell you that he is one of the best people I have ever met in the world. He's a constant friend and he thinks of others more than he thinks of himself. So I want to again wish him the very, very best on this special recognition. And thank you for the opportunity to talk about Paul McGuire, a great friend. And to present uh, the, uh, the award for the 2018 inductee for Mr. Paul McGuire, please welcome to the stage General Bud Watts. Woo! Mr. Barrett, ladies and gentlemen, to say that I'm intimidated, you got it right, because I'm intimidated by this crowd and by the honorees here tonight. When I was uh, down at the Citadel as a cadet and also later as president, I was told by the coaches that football coaches couldn't recruit outstanding players at the Citadel because you had to march and you had to wear uniforms. Al Davis, who came to the Citadel in 1955, decided that he was going to bring some good players into the Citadel. He uh, went up to Youngstown, Ohio, and against Woody Hayes, competed to get Paul McGuire to come to Charleston. And in order to do that, he had to tell Paul, said, you don't have to wear uniforms down there, and you don't have to, you, you, you know what, you just, you just don't have to march you just have to put on a football uniform. Well, guess what? Paul McGuire came down to the Charleston, to the Citadel, and he went to the training field and he put on a football uniform, and about a, 10 days later, the training cadre came in and the freshman football players had to go get trained on how to be a cadet. I would have loved to have been a fly on the wall to hear Paul's response when he was issued his uniforms to wear all day and all night and in each day. He was a man of his word. He had accepted the offer to come to the Citadel. He was freshman of the year, his freshman year. He was player of the year and the Southern Conference his senior year. His signature win in that senior year for an eight and two team beat West Virginia 20 to 14 Paul McGuire was credited with an 86-yard punt from the line of scrimmage, and he caught two touchdown passes at that time. All right, I'm talking about Paul McGuire as a college player. I'm talking about Paul McGuire as an NFL, AFL player. I'm talking about Paul McGuire as a broadcaster. 
Paul McGuire was third team AP All-American his senior year. He was drafted number one uh, in the first draft of the AFL in 1959-60. He was drafted by the Los Angeles Chargers, went out to California, and they moved to San Diego. And the best thing in the world that ever happened to Paul McGuire in San Diego was he met his wife, Beverly, and she brought him uh, all the way back. And not only that, Paul ended up in Buffalo. He was the, one of 20 players that played the entire lifetime of the AFL, and including the first year when the leagues merged, he was still playing. He was a punter, he had a lot of punting records for the AFL. And Paul McGuire played in two Pro Bowls. He took six teams to the championship game in the AFL, and they won two of them. And that's, that was how he was uh, as a professional player. Now, the third part of this, the triangle, is the broadcasting career. Paul McGuire went with NBC. He was a trailblazer. He was one of the earliest players to ever be the color commentators for the primary NBC national broadcast. And not only that, he was good enough to do two Super Bowls. And then from the Super Bowls, he went to ESPN, and he worked eight years as the color commentator for the Sunday night ESPN football, NFL football game. Why do I take great pride in introducing you to Paul McGuire? He's a man of integrity, he's a man of honor, and he's a man of duty. And he represents the core values that we have at the Citadel, duty, honor, and respect. Ladies and gentlemen, we are enshrining Paul McGuire in the National or the South Carolina Football Hall of Fame. Paul McGuire. Let me just say something. He's older than I am, and he remembered all that crap. <laughs> yeah, he's president of the Citadel. What a great man. Mr. Watts, Mr. General, great friend for a long time. He also helped me get a doctorate degree at the Citadel. So if anybody has any heart palpitations, anything, I'm an honorary doctor, I can handle it. You know, all my life, People have given me, and situations have given me, the opportunity to participate. And something I want you all to remember tonight, and when you go home, I want you to think about all the people in your life, because none of us have ever done this alone. Nobody has. Think about someone that gave you the opportunity to participate in life or do something in business. If they're passed away, say a prayer. But if they're alive, give them a call or write them a note. And I promise you, they'll know what it's for. And you don't have to say what it's for. Because none of us can do this without help from friends and people who gave us the opportunity to participate. Now I'm going to get down to a guy that gave me the opportunity to participate in 1955. I was at Ursuline High School in Youngstown, Ohio. And as a lot of players in those days were on the Ohio All-Star game team and all that stuff, and I got scholarships for a lot of schools. And a guy knocked at the door at our house, 34 Forest Avenue. Our phone number was Riverside 72907, and he never called because we had just gotten a phone. But the guy at the door was Al Davis. For those of you that know who, don't know who Al Davis is, he was the owner, the head coach of the Oakland Raiders. And in 1955, when he talked me into going to the Citadel, I think, I don't know for sure, but I may have been the first person he ever lied to. 
This son of a bitch took me to the Citadel. <laughs> he took me to the stadium. And the first thing he did is when I got off the plane in Charleston, I only had a little bag because we were, my father was an old railroader. And we didn't have much. So he had what shirts and pants I had. He had the, the guy at, at the airport in Charleston take it. So I didn't have any clothes to wear other than what I had on. So he took me out and bought me clothes. This is true. He took me to the Citadel. And is anybody here other than the people of the Citadel, have you ever been to Johnson Haygood Stadium? Yes, sir. Seats 10,000? Packed. 10,000 packed. He took me up to the press box, and he stood behind me. And he said, look at this. And I'm looking, thinking, hell, our high school field is bigger than this. <laughs> And he said, and he gets right behind me off of this shoulder with his hands on my shoulders and said, picture this. And hell, I went crazy. I'm, I'm looking. He said, the announcer on your freshman year would say, out of the tunnel comes, and we didn't even have a tunnel. <laughs> out of the tunnel comes number 86 from Youngstown, Ohio, starting wide receiver. For the Citadel Bulldogs, Paul McGuire. 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 He's in my ear. Hell, I had goosebumps, the biggest golf balls on my head. I said, hell, I'm in. I'm playing. I'm, standing. I'm signing. I'm signing. I did. I actually signed. After we got out of there, went right to his office. I signed a damn contract to come to the Citadel. But my father told me, he said, no matter where you go, please promise me one thing. You'll stay for four years, which I did the best four years of my life, so help me God. If it weren't for the Citadel, and I'm giving you another example of the opportunity to participate. After the Citadel, there was the American Football League started up, and the, in the National Football League, Jeff of the Washington Redskins, and I was picked 17th by both. Hmm. I don't know where the hell Bud got that number one, because I wasn't. 17th, and I thought, I had someone say, nobody had agents in those days, nobody had attorneys, nobody had anything. I never had an agent in the 11 years I played. But I thought, if you're going to play, why don't you go to a new team? And then in those days, they only had 32 players on the team. I said, you're going to have a better chance to play there. And let me just tell you, when I went to the Citadel, he did, I did play for the Citadel my freshman year, every game. He said, you will have a chance to play in pro football if you go to the American Football League, because they're all new guys. I went, opportunity to participate. I went to Buffalo after that in 1964. I lasted 11 years. That's an opportunity to participate and make something out of it. That's this guy. Well, then as when, I, when I was playing football for the Buffalo Bills at the end of, the guys that did our games was Kurt Gowdy and Paul Christman. And I became a good friend of Kurt Gowdy's and he said, have you ever thought about announcing? I said, are you crazy? I said, I never thought anything about anything. Just get the hell out of the Citadel and going home. <laughs> he said, well, let me recommend you to NBC. And he did. God's honest truth when I tell you this. CBS found out about it. Now, this is 1971. They called me. They knew I was coming to New York to talk to NBC. They called me in CBS, and they sat down. I sat down with, I don't know who these guys were. They said, you know, we like your stories. We like who you are. We'd like to hire you. But you don't have any experience. And I went, how the hell am I supposed to get experience if you don't give it to me? I've been playing football for 11 years, you dummy. So I left there and I went to NBC and I sat and they looked at me and they talked to me for about an hour and a half and they said, you're hired. But the best part about this, they didn't, I didn't even do a game until after the seventh game of the season. They finally called and said, we want you to go to do Cincinnati and Houston, in, in Houston. I said, I didn't know I had a job. They said, well, we had to wait for something for you to do. And 46 years later, I just retired a year ago. That's about somebody that gave me the opportunity to participate. And it happens to all of us. And I know that you're only allowed five minutes, but I'm 80 years old. So I'm going to take five minutes and 15 seconds. And that's all I'm taking, because my wife is timing me. And I'm talking about the opportunity to participate and the people you may meet on the way.
Dick Enberg, as you know, was really a, a dear friend of mine, of, uh, of everybody's. I think the best announcer that has ever lived. And he passed away not too long ago. But I, we did two games. We were in Cleveland, for one, and he's up in a booth, and Tommy Roy was our producer, and we had talked about this because we knew that Bon Jovi was gonna be on the sidelines. So Tommy Roy said to Dick, and Dick didn't know Bon Jovi from anybody, and neither did we at that time, and Dick said, or Tommy Roy said to Dick, Bon Jovi's walking down the sidelines, we put the camera on him, introduce him. So he's walking down, and he'd just come back that summer from doing the French Open, because he loved tennis. <clears throat> he said, ladies and gentlemen, behind the Cleveland bench walking down is Bon Jovi. <laughs> <laughs> and Tommy Roy, a producer, because you can hear all that stuff in your ear, and he goes, who the hell is that? He said, and we hit the button, you could talk to him, he says, he's the guy you told me to introduce. He says, it's Bon Jovi, you dummy. <laughs> now, wait a minute, because I had to write this down. We're doing the championship game uh, in Cleveland, Denver, as playing Cleveland. And the guy that was going to sing the national anthem, and we got a list on Saturday when we're talking about all these things you've got to introduce. Dick, Dick did everything so well, but Enberg just forgot about some things. And he said, and Tommy Roy said, the guy that's gonna do the national anthem is Huey Lewis in the news. And Dick goes, good. And he's got it written down. So now, Dick goes, before, uh, just let's stop for a moment and we'll have the kickoff. And Tommy Roy said, Jesus, Dick, how many times I gotta tell you, throw it to Huey Lewis in the news. So Dick says, We'll pause for a second. It'll probably take a couple of minutes. We're going to go to New York City to our studios at NBC for Huey Lewis and the news. <laughs> Pardon me, but the first time that I ever heard Tommy Roy said, you dumbass, he said he's doing the national anthem. He said, well, why didn't you tell me? Honestly, God, you can talk about Dick Enberg all your life, and he's just the most wonderful person I think I've ever met. But again, I just want to mention before I go, and my five minutes and 15 seconds is up, everybody that gives you an opportunity to participate, and it happened to me almost 56 years ago when I met Beverly McGuire, or Beverly Bauer. And Beverly and I have been married for almost 56 years. We have three daughters, Woo! Kelly, Kristen, and Catherine. Just like their, they are really like your mother. They're beautiful kids. And she gave me the opportunity, and I mean this honest to God, to participate with her in all three children. I mean having all three children. I was allowed to participate. It was a great opportunity for me and I took it. And I thank you for that, honey. I gotta go, but I gotta tell you one thing. Thank you very much. This is a great honor for me and all of the inductees. Thank you for thinking of us. Thank you for honoring us. In South Carolina, is, I went to school here in 1956, and my wife and I now live in Charleston, South Carolina. And there's no place that we would rather be. Thank you, everybody. Woo!